Okay. Friends, I welcome you as you join us in person or on Zoom on this first Sunday after Christmas Day. We love seeing all of you. My name is Owen, and I am your liturgist today. Friends on Zoom, please keep yourself muted, especially when singing the hymns. Only unmute yourself when you do the response. If you are unmuted, make sure your room is quiet. We welcome our beloved guest preacher, Reverend John Chamberlain, to worship with us today. We thank him for the special message he brings for us. Come and join the New Year's Day activity, full of fun and the spirit of fellowship. It's a wonderful way to start the new year. Thank you, Charlie Ho, for organizing the activity. If you want to come, please be at the Larky Park Walnut Creek. Meet at Larky Lane near 2nd Avenue by 9 a.m and call Charlie on his cell phone if you are planning to come, so he'll be waiting for you. Area code 925-348-5825. We will welcome Reverend Sam Law, uncle to Vicki and Eva, and his congregation of the Great Shepherd Baptist Church from Castro Valley to visit and worship with our CM brothers and sisters next Sunday, January the 7th. Please come early at 1030 in the morning to join the Tea Time Fellowship to welcome them and show our hospitality. Uh, before we get into this uh, altar, I want to add this additional announcement about the nonprofit Friends of Wadi Fokin, together with the Castro Valley United Methodist Church, is hosting a teach-in on Friday, January 5th at 6 p.m. This is a free event with a light meal available for purchase. Our friend from Palestine, Adam Manasra, will be sharing. The church is at 19806 Wisteria Street in Castro Valley. You can contact uh, Becky 
if you have further questions and want to learn more. If you donated poinsettias, you're welcome to take them home after service on Sunday. Okay, now we're back to uh, the flowers on the altar. You are invited to support our altar flower ministry, which is $10 each Sunday, and you'll use the offering envelope uh, for your offering. If your offering is for the altar flower, please write down the Sundays that you want your donation to be uh, used for. If your offering is a regular offering, please put a cross mark on the label that says altar flower. When I first read this, I said, why are we putting a cross mark? But that's like an X, you know, like, <laughs> you... <laughs> anyway, after I read it this morning, I understood that Chinese is my second language. Okay. <laughs> All right. Good. I want you to have a good laugh. We will update the photo board starting January 2024. Please contact Peggy. She will help take a picture of you. Now, I invite you to take a deep breath and join me in the call to worship. Please stand as you are able and join me in the call to worship. Friends on Zoom, you may unmute yourself to join the response in the bold print. The Maji came from many places following a star. We come, come to, to worship, worship and the star sheds light, light on our lives. lives. The Maji bought gifts to offer the child. We too we bring, bring, bring gifts and ourselves, our hopes, our dreams. And our dreams. Shepherds and Maji, the meek and the mighty, all were welcome in Bethlehem. We, we too come, come to Bethlehem, Bethlehem and then, and then return, return rejoicing, rejoicing by another, another way, way to our home. homes. All right, great. Now we'll have our opening hymn. Friends, I now invite you to raise our voice and sing our opening hymn, This is a Day of New Beginning. Please remain standing as you are able. Opening hymn can be found in the United Methodist Hymnal 383. No, this, uh, 141. Okay. Peggy is going to lead us with One, grace on the piano. Page 145 in the Methodist hymnal. Okay, Sorry. thank you. Thank you. 
Okay, that was a bit of a hitch. We had the words to morning has broken. Well, we had the tune, but um, so we got it together. Thank you, congregation. Very good. Join me in the opening prayer now. May this holy season be for each of us a time of moving beyond what is reasonable and toward the star of wonder. Moving beyond grasping tight to what we have, to unclenching our hands and letting go, following the light where it leads. Moving beyond competition toward cooperation, seeing that all humans are sisters and brothers. Moving beyond the anxiety of small concerns towards the joys of injustice and peace. May the transforming acceptance of Mary and Joseph, the imagination of the shepherds, and the persistence of the wise men guide us as we seek the truth. Always moving toward the divine promise, always aware God can be hidden in the frailest among us always open to the unexpected flash of grace, to the showing forth of that love that embraces us all. We pray all these in the name of our Lord Jesus, who taught us to pray the Lord's Prayer. Let us now pray the Lord's Prayer together in unison. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not, not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Now let us hear and reflect on the word and we'll have our scripture reading led by Laurel. Laura. Good morning. Happy New Year's Eve. Uh, or dear. Uh, this Listen with the whole heart and what the Holy Spirit has to say through God's word. Matthew 2, verses 1 to 12. Now, when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. And assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. He told, they told him in Bethlehem of Judea. For so it is written by the prophet, and you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you all shall come a ruler who will govern my people Israel. Then Herod summoned the wise men, secretly and ascertain from them that the time of the star, what time uh, the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child, and when you have found him, bring me word, and I too may come and worship him. When they had heard the king, they went their way, and lo, the star which was seen in the east went before them, till it came to rest over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoice exceedingly with great joy. 
And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother. And they fell down and wished him and worshiped him. Then opening their treasures, they, they offered him gifts, gold, Frankenstein, Franken, <laughs> frankincense, and myrrh. And being born in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. It's the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Now let us welcome Reverend Chamberlain to share a message with us. Reverend. Unmute, John. Un unmute. Unmute. One more. Yeah, ah. there you are. Good. Good. You're now Thank here. You. Well, as I said, uh, I'm very happy to be in worship with all of you. I am sorry to uh, kind of let the side down a little bit. I plan to be there in person, but uh, that didn't happen. So uh, uh, I'm uh, still glad to be here. And thank you for uh, helping the... Uh, the non-savvy -sa tech person uh, get up to speed a little bit this morning. In Matthew's gospel, Jesus is born and strange visitors appear from the east. The English version of this text usually calls these mysterious figures wise men or kings. Although, that's misleading. Originally, they're simply referred to as magi, a word that means magicians, but that has a slightly different connotation back then than it does today. It included a conglomerate of uh, different types, astronomers, fortune tellers, and uh, other people of somewhat dubious reputation and, and credibility. Later Christian translators were apparently uncomfortable with the idea of occultists and sorcerers hanging around the creche. So these characters became wise men or kings. However, who decided that they were three in number or that their names were Gaspar, Balthazar, and Melchar, or that they came from Africa, Asia, and Europe, or that they consisted of a young man, a middle-aged man, and an old man, how all this came about is unknown. All sorts of legends have sprung up around these figures. By the way, there's uh, no record of their having rode in on camels either. What is certain is the poetic truth this story of Matthew's conveys in just a few short verses. The truth that Christ's mission is universal and that people came from far away and by many different routes to worship him. Essentially, what we see in the Magi is the accumulated wisdom of the human family kneeling down before baby Jesus. Still, beginning the story of Christ's birth with these Magi's, does seem peculiar. After all, what do these star-gazing Iraqi astrologers know anyway? They're the wrong race and the wrong religion. Not exactly the people you would expect to be attuned to the revelation of God. 
how ironical it is then that these outsiders are the first and only ones to pay homage to the long-awaited Jewish Messiah. There's something else that uh, I think it's interesting to notice about this, this story. Notice how the reaction of the Magi stands in very sharp contrast to that of Herod and the sophisticated elite who surrounded him in Jerusalem. You might have expected the Magi's announcement would have precipitate would precipitate wild joy and excitement. After all, the history of Israel is about to reach its goal. The star the Magi had been following is about to reach its high point in the heavens. At long last, the promised Messiah has come. But how do these well-situated pillars of the community respond? As we heard read, Herod was troubled. He was frightened and all Jerusalem with him. Like most luxury ridden, power hungry people of privilege, the last thing they seemed to have wanted was a savior to release them from their sins. They were doing quite nicely, thank you. So they reacted to this event with its implied moral evaluation with hostility. On the other hand, the chief priests and scribes, they weren't exactly thrilled by this news either. You might have expected these religious leaders who have been especially excited that the prophecy that they all knew so well was about to be fulfilled. You would have thought that they would have leapt at the chance to join the Magi on the last leg of their journey. Just six short miles from Jerusalem to Bethlehem. I'm thinking some of you may have uh, made that journey yourselves. But no, instead they turned back to their institutional concerns and pursuits. They were busy at the temple, pleasing the establishment, cooperating with Herod, missing God's epiphany. This is the disturbing paradox of Matthew's story. Those who have the scriptures fail to see what the scriptures show, while strange foreigners fall down at the manger and worship Jesus, offering all that they have to the Christ child. And then, as we heard read in the last verse, Having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, the Magi left for their own country by another road. You'll notice in the Bible that God often speaks to people through, through dreams. And I want to focus the sermon on this, on this last verse and what it might say to us. It says, having been warned in a dream not to return to Herod, the Magi left for their own country by another way. You see, although the story doesn't specifically say so, the Magi really were wise men. They refused to be taken in by the lies and deception of the government. They didn't just stay the course. They returned to their own country by another way.
there's a, a sentimentalizing tendency at work in our culture that encourages us to leave Herod out of the Christmas story. And that's a big mistake. Herod's massacre of the innocents, which is found immediately after this morning's passage, that's in Matthew chapter 2, verses 13 through 23. But Herod's massacre of the infants isn't even included in our lectionary reading anymore. And, and that's a shame. So I want to make the case for why that's important. Several years ago, Joy Carol Wallace, she's an Anglican priest who happens to be married to Jim Wallace, the editor-in-chief of Sojourners Magazine. Some of you may be familiar with that. But anyway, she wrote an article entitled, Putting Herod Back into Christmas. And she pointed out that this sanitization of the Christmas story is a relatively recent development. It's interesting that before the Victorian era, Christmas songs were much more likely to reflect the reality of Jesus' entry into our world. Carols would not hesitate to refer to the blood and sacrifices of Jesus, or the story about Herod's slaughtering the innocent children. As an example of the contrast, she says, just read through the, so, the uh, words of away in a manger. In a way in the manger, Jesus is the perfect baby. No crying he makes. Really? I bet Jesus cried a lot. We know from the Gospels that the more Jesus saw of the world in which he lived, the more that he mourned and wept regularly. He was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. A Jesus who doesn't weep with those who weep. A Jesus who's just a sentimental myth may be the one our culture prefers. But that Jesus can have nothing to do with us. Joy Wallace went on to say, in Britain there's a very popular musician by the name of Cliff Richard. And uh, some years ago he released a, a Christmas song that reached the top 10 in the charts. The lyrics of Savior's Day, his song, reflected his Christian faith and included such lines as, life can be yours on Savior's Day, don't look back or turn away. Joy Wallace says, I picked up a teenage pop magazine where there was an article reviewing the season's Christmas songs. When it came to Savior's Day, the writer said, eh, this song is okay, but there's no holly, no mistletoe and wine, no presents around the tree, no snow, no Santa. In fact, this song hasn't got anything to do with Christmas at all. <laughs> and then she cites a radio DJ in this country who said, what Christmas is all about is the celebration of living in a great nation like this. Christmas is not the celebration of this great nation. It's the celebration 
of Jesus Christ. That's what Christmas is about. All of which is to say, I think we need to take care not to let the world reduce our spirituality to nostalgia and sentimentality. The danger of sentimentality is that we tend to lose interest in the parts of the story that are disturbing, that, that aren't so comfortable. We smile at the warm nativity scene, but have you ever spent a night in a barn or given birth in a barn? The reality is very different. It's interesting for me to hear about the uh, teaching that's going to take place uh, uh, later on this week at Castro Valley. Particularly, so I encourage all of you to uh, attend that. Uh, I say that in part because Palestinian Christians know this reality very, very well. No one needs to remind them to put Herod back into Christmas. There's no danger of sentimentality there. They know Herod all too well. And I want to make that point this morning by uh, quoting two uh, Palestinian pastors from Bethlehem. The first is Reverend Dr. Mitri Rahab, who's the president of a university in Bethlehem. And when he was interviewed shortly before Christmas, he said, this really personalizes, he said, the Christmas story is the Palestinian story par excellence. It talks about a family in Nazareth, in the north of Palestine, who is ordered by imperial Roman decree to evacuate to Bethlehem to register. And this is what our people in Gaza have been experiencing these last 90 days. The story talks about Mary, the pregnant woman on the run, exactly like 50,000 pregnant women in, Gal in, uh, in Gaza who've been forcibly displaced from their homes and suffer from malnutrition. He says, Jesus was born as a refugee. There is no place in the inn for him to be born, so he was put in a manger. And this is what kids coming to life these days in Gaza are experiencing. You know, most of the hospitals have been destroyed or badly damaged, and there's no delivery places for all these pregnant, malnourished women in Gaza. And then you have bloodthirsty Herod, who ordered the killing of the kids in Bethlehem to stay in power. And in Gaza, over 9,000 kids have been murdered for Netanyahu to stay in power. Netanyahu, of course, is the prime minister of Israel. What Israel's doing in Gaza is not self-defense. It's the mass slaughter of a helpless population. It's about war crimes and atrocities. Another uh, pastor from, uh, from Bethlehem, Reverend Munther Isaac, makes much the same point. Uh, he's uh, at the Evangelical Lutheran Christmas Church in Bethlehem. Anyway, he uh, did a sermon that was uh, broadcast worldwide. And as a background for his sermon, 
he had a nativity scene depicting the figure of baby Jesus wrapped in a kaffiya, the scarf that uh, Palestinians often wear, and the infant baby Jesus is lying in a pile of rubble. And the title of the sermon was Christ Under the Rubble. And this is the way he, he began. This is sort of his cry to the world, began by saying, we are angry, we are broken. This, is, this should have been a time of joy. Instead, we are mourning, we're fearful. I'm gonna update the figures a little bit here. More than 200,000 people have been killed Thousands are still under the rubble. Over 9,000 children have been killed in the most brutal ways, day after day. At least 1.9 million people have been displaced. Hundreds of thousands of homes have been destroyed. The whole infrastructure of this small strip of land has been destroyed. Gaza, as we know it, no longer exists. This is annihilation. This is genocide. And then he went on to say, the world is watching. Churches are watching. The people of Gaza are sending live images of their own execution. Maybe the world cares, but it goes on. We are tormented by the silence of the world. Palestinian Christians can't understand how the world is okay with, with what's going on. He says, we're outraged by the complicity of the church. Let it be clear, friends, silence is complicity. An empty calls for peace without a ceasefire and an end to the occupation, and the shallow words of empathy without direct action, all fall under the banner of complicity. If we as Christians are not outraged by the genocide, there's something wrong with our Christian witness and we are compromising the credibility of our gospel message. This is Reverend Isaac's message that he uh, sends out to the world. I think it speaks particularly to uh, us as Americans, because we're being uh, misinformed and flat out lied to by most of our politicians and mainstream media about this situation. Our government's unrestrained support for Israel's actions, support that's military, diplomatic, and financial, makes us all, as citizens of this country, complicit in this crime of crimes. Anyway, Reverend Isaac ended his Christmas message with these words. He said, this is our message to the world. This genocide must stop. Stop this genocide now. And he had his congregation, congregation repeat that plea. That's kind of their, their prayer and what they're asking of uh, Christians uh, worldwide to help them do. This Christmas, Jesus was in Gaza is in Gaza under the rubble. And that really 
shouldn't surprise us. It's just where Matthew said we should look for Jesus. Remember in Matthew chapter 25, people ask, Lord, when did we see you hungry, thirsty, sick, in prison, a refugee, a victim of terrorism or state-sponsored violence? And the answer came back, whatever you did to one of the least of these, my sisters or my brothers, you did it to me. Jesus is the perfect savior for a suffering people, a people who've been dehumanized, labeled non-persons and made expendable. I take to heart seriously this uh, call that we get from Christian sisters and brothers in Palestine. Let us renew our commitment then to being a sign for the world of the wisdom and power of God. A God we see supremely revealed in little baby Jesus crying in a manger. And as foreshadowed in today's lesson, Christ's suffering on the cross. A God who cares for the victims of injustice, violence, and oppression. And a God who asks us to do the same. May God help us make it so. Amen. Thank you, John. Are we going to break into our rooms? Peggy, are you? Okay. How important do you think it is to put Herod back into Christmas? And the second question, what are some of the dangers you see in sentimentalizing Christmas? Looks like we'll have two groups, one in the chapel and one on Zoom. All right. Thank, thank you. We'll come back to uh, responding to the word, passing of the peace, because Jesus Christ is in us and we in him. His peace is a powerful gift that we may share with others. Let's pass the peace of Christ to our brothers and sisters in Christ and to all the children of God. The peace of Christ be always with you. Friends on Zoom, you may unmute yourself to do so. And when done, please mute yourself again. We can now share uh, community joys and concerns. You are invited to share joys and concerns for yourself, your community, and God's world so that we might lift them up in common prayer. When you share, please unmute yourself. After all who would like to name their joys and concerns, let us respond by singing, O oh Lord, hear our prayers. Who would like to share any Anyone joys, Anyone in the congregation concerns? want to share a, a joy or concern? Tony, okay. I'm going to start off with Tony here in the congregation, in the sanctuary. This is the last Sunday in the year is New Year's Day and salvation and cost the United Nations. We all ask in the New Year's tonight, till midnight in New Year's 2024. It beginning in January has the beginning on Monday and all to the whole cost the United States. 
Then to the company to say anytime soon. And then good luck. And we'll see you, see you, you years five words. Right away. That isn't that much important. Okay. Anyone on Zoom want to share? Thank you. Yes, uh, I'll say uh, uh, I, I, I want to like send out a, a, a big hug and prayer to uh, Reverend John, who's get, getting over uh, a few uh, ailments, and to uh, anyone out there that feels a need to have some support. I think in this time of the season, it's very easy to feel like you are left out. So I want to give a hug to everybody for that. And I want to lift up the city of Oakland, the Oakland Police Department, for the passing of the police officer. Uh, may he rest in peace. We thank him for his service. Yes, very sad. Uh, also, Brenda. She's down in Southern Cal with all her grandchildren. I was amazed how many grandchildren she has garnered, and they have the, the storms down there, so I'm sure they're wanting to go out and see it, but I hope they will stay safe. And traveling mercies to Pastor Mayna while she enjoys her vacation. Okay, we will now sing our song of response. Mm -hmm. Okay, we believe in the God of, injust, of justice and righteousness, and God believes in us to carry forth the mission of loving and caring for community. Let us now share our gifts and resources so that we may continue to walk humbly with God and with neighbors. Please come forward to place your gifts on the plate at the front of the pews and use the side aisles to get back to your seat. Of course, for those on Zoom, I invite you to lift your hands up as a sign to offer your gifts. Let us pray. Dear God, we dedicate these gifts that have been shared for the fortification of the beloved community. Let these gifts do justice in the world so that all may know they are loved by you. Amen. Friends, I now invite you to sing our closing hymn, God of Grace and God of Glory. Please stand if you are able. Closing hymn can be found on United Methodist Hymnal 577, and it will be sung by Peggy with Grace on the Piano.
Let us now invite Reverend Chamberlain to give us a benediction. May the image of Christ, the hunted child, move people of faith to oppose the evil of ruthless rulers today. May the image of Christ, the endangered refugee, move people of faith to provide sanctuary and care for the homeless. May we resolve never again to tolerate cruelty or neglect but to live in tenderness towards all people through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, the Prince of Peace. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit abide with us all now and forevermore. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. I think Grace is going to give us. There it is.